Okay. Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Thanks for clicking on the class and uh, hopefully watching this overview of this um, volume two of the Pro Staff Bass class, which is going to be basically wrapped around the fall and the temperatures cooling down for the fall, the water temperature and the air temperature, and what that's going to do to the fish and what that's going to do to your fishing. And in the second half of the class, we're going to talk about matching the hatch with soft plastic shad imitators, which shad typically in the fall are going to be your number one forage for trying to mimic and trying to find to put you on more fish because these bass are going to start schooling more on shad. It's going to be their key focus to feed up before the winter. So we're going to get started. So getting ready for the fall is is thinking about what the fall does to your water whether you're in a river whether you're fishing ponds whether you're fishing a lake big reservoir or small the the air temperature is going to be what we all experience is when we know the fall has gotten here so cool mornings those crisp nights and in the daytime you know doesn't really get out of the 70s it's not muggy anymore um it's a real nice usually have some breeze so we know the fall is here when we feel it so your cooler, longer nights are going to help reduce the water temperatures. In the summer, your night doesn't last very long. It doesn't get dark till 8, 30, 9 o'clock, and it gets light again at 5, 30. So you have a, a much shorter night, and it's muggy and warm, and that helps that water temperature get up and stay up really high. In the fall, you start having your nights are longer. You know, it's going to get dark at 6, 30, 7 o'clock not going to get light again until about seven o'clock again so you have a nice long night and those cooler temperatures in the low 60s and 50s even 40s are going to start pulling that water temperature down and the fish are going to realize that so the next bullet the creeks will cool down first they're already cooler than the main channel they're already cooler than ponds the creeks with the moving water that come through those shaded woods um, that come from the groundwater they're going to cool down first, which is why most of your shad are going to go there, which is the next bullet. It's got more oxygen holding capability. It's flowing. It's cooler. Usually it's a little clearer, depending on if you've had a lot of rain or not. But the shad will be drawn to those cooler pockets of water. It's just a fact. Everybody runs to the creeks, if not all the way to the back, to find the bait fish in the fall. And as a rule, clear, deeper water will stay cooler than shallow, stained water because there's not as much hanging in it. So when you have a lot of sediment or chlorophyll or, or you know just stain in the body of water, it holds heat longer. So you know your shallow pond, it's got a bunch of green algae or, or you know turbidity from sediment from mud in it, is going to warm up and stay warmer longer than a gin clear pond will so keep that in mind if you want to keep hanging on to that little bit warmer water for whatever reason as the fall progresses the the stained slower moving water that's shallow will get and stay warmer if you want to fish cooler water try to find clear water that has a little bit of depth around it and typically it'll be a little cooler unless you have artificial heat you know situations like steam plants or nuclear plants which we can't control that so where the stratification is present, where you have a, a body of water that's deep enough to have stratification, that hotter surface water, like at a dam of a big lake like Norman or Wiley, or even Mount Island for that matter, here in Charlotte, the hotter surface water is going to start cooling down. When it does that, it gets heavier and it starts dropping and it starts to mix and, and co-mingle and turn over with the thermocline and the other bottom water that's already staying cooler because sunlight can't reach it. So once that happens, that frees up a lot of movement from those fish that have been staying deep all summer and staying in the thermocline. They can move around now, follow the bait fish, and feed up for winter. So we're going to talk about that now. <clears throat> this is a graph I found on Crappy. I couldn't find one quite this clean and this descriptive for bass, but if you know, bass and Crappy are decently similar in how they behave they're both top end predators. Um, you know, they always follow the bait fish and feed in the fall. Kind of similar. They don't school as much on the surface, obviously, but they do push the shad and try to eat them. So in the springtime, <clears throat> everybody's fishing shallow because every fish that's an adult that wants to 
have its offspring, you know, survive, runs up shallow to spawn. So we all are up there flipping bushes, cranking stumps, you know, fishing real super shallow lily pads, stuff like that. It's probably one of the most fun times to fish, honestly, is spring and late spring for that matter. So in springtime, you know, all your oxygen's everywhere. The, the water's still cool. It's starting to warm up. The fish are getting aggressive. In summertime, you've got that real hot surface water. Um, you know, it warms up to 80, sometimes even 90 degrees, like in Lake Norman. And those fish can't handle that heat. Um, they move down and suspend, like you see in the summer box there. And they'll kind of be all over the place. So they'll come up in the morning to eat because it's, it's the most opportune time to do that. And at night, for that matter. But, you know, during the day, those dog days of summer, those fish are hanging out there suspended, trying to find the right layer of oxygen and temperature that makes them comfortable. So summertime fishing can really be bad if you don't like trying to hunt these suspended fish down or you don't like fishing at night. In the fall, if you'll notice the box down there on the bottom left, the fish are all over the place. And that's because you're getting this mixing of water. So it says there on the box that crappy don't like you know, the mixing of different temperatures and they'll try to move around. They're moving around because they're able to now. Um, and the, the fish have all these different opportunities of, of moving around and finding bait fish and bass in particular, all they want to do is eat. Um, the cooling water, I think triggers a feed mechanism to them. They know the bait fish are going to be hot to trot and schooled up from, from spawning in May. All those shad that were born in May are real tiny inch and a half, two inches, and they're young and stupid, and they're going to go bum rush them into schools in big coves, in main channels, in creeks, wherever they can. And different lakes will have different quote-unquote honey holes of that where it happens every morning. And then sometimes you'll be driving down a lake, and all of a sudden there's a school of them busting, and you can't control that. They could be anywhere. Trying to predict that will help, but in the fall, they could be biting anywhere. Again, going through the winter, the fish are going to run deep because of that colder surface temperature and the, the, the variability of the, the snow and, and the cold wind churning up the surface. They want to be a little bit more comfortable you know, water temps, so they pull out deep um, once the winter really lays up here. So <clears throat> to go over the bullet points again, the bigger bass can come shallower and stay longer. There's more oxygen. There's more bait fish up around. They can come on up. They don't have to stay out in 30 feet of water. Like I said, the need to feed overtakes comfort. They're going to bum rush the shad and feed up, getting ready for winter. This will happen a little heavier in November and early December for us here in Charlotte because we don't slide into dead of winter until about late December and January, depending on what kind of fall we've had. So November, I would still consider fall, early December, even fall there as well for us here. Again, talked about schooling fish will move to the backs of the creeks. Watch for the birds. If you watch for seagulls, if you watch for great blue herons and things like that, they'll tell you where the bait fish are. And if you can pull up into a cove and you see two or three or four great blue herons walking the bank back there, they're on some shallow bait fish somewhere, and the bass won't be far behind. Also, keep your eyes open for your seagulls diving. They will definitely eat the snot out of shad if they can. Typically, they'll show you where a big school are, and hopefully there's bass underneath them. But just keep your eye out for birds. They can tell you a lot. The residential fish this time of year can set up on multiple different types of cover. Trees, for me, are a huge deal. I feel like wood seems to be a really good area for them to suspend and ambush from um, and points and things like that. But they could be on everything this time of year, guys. They could be you know, laid up under docks if we have a really sunny day. They could be in vegetation if it hadn't died off yet. Most of the time I look for natural cover. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I'm fishing more creeks and more creeks typically have natural cover in them. But for some odd reason, I really like fishing natural cover this time of year. Wood, things like that, rock piles. It, it feels like that's where they like to lay up and get ready to ambush shad. But half the time if you're fishing for school and fish like that, they don't need any cover. We're just talking about residential fish. Onesie, twosie, here's and there. Um they're probably not going to be out suspended anymore. They're going to be laid up under a piece of cover. And for us around here that catch spotted bass, they are more likely going to suspend and pack hunt than be residential. The real big spotted bass, you know, two and a half, three pounders, even up bigger than that, they will be residential. They'll lay up in a, in a tree or a dock or what have you. And sometimes they'll school too, but 
you know, your average spotted bass, your 14 to 17 inch fish, they're going to be out pack hunting. That's what they like to do. It's what they're really good at. And you'll see that on Norman and Mount Nine for that matter a lot. So um, if you get on a big school of fish and you find their largemouth, you've hit the honey hole uh, around here because most of your big packs of bass around here are spots. So where would I start? Um, for me, if I was going to slide the kayak in tomorrow on a new body of water, where I would want to look for first would be some clear to slightly stained water that is shallower than the main channel with some type of natural cover and some moving water. It ain't even got to be fast. It can just be some type of flow coming from a creek channel. That's typically going to be the coolest and most oxygen rich area available, which means bait fish. Um, if you can't put all those together, try to put as many together as you want for how you would like to fish that day. Y'all all like to fish different ways. I like to fish different ways. Um, try to dial this in when you're looking at your maps, when you're looking at Google Earth, to figure out where you want to try to fish to maximize your enjoyment and your productivity for that day. Um, people that fish a worm all day and enjoy it versus people that fish a topwater all day and enjoy it may not be in the same location. So... Just keep that in mind. Just make all this work for you guys. My top patterns for the fall. Shad style topwaters are a must. If you have any kind of confidence or enjoyment with topwaters at all, this is the time to be doing it. So you got constant topwaters and stop and go. And I'm going to talk about all that in a minute. Crankbaits based on your water clarity and your forge and your depth. So square bills are great, but square bills aren't going to work on 10 to 12 foot docks or 15 foot rock piles whatever try to pick a crankbait based on the water clarity the clearer the more natural you want it the forge you're trying to mimic if it's a blueback herring if it's baby baby shad whatever that's going to differ based on what lake you're in where you are in that lake and your depth if you need your crankbait to run a certain depth dial it in about a foot or two deeper and that way you know you'll hit it like you need to but a square bill is a real good place to start. A 1.5, something like that size square bill. Spinner baits chosen by your water clarity, again, which will dictate the blades, but also your speed. In dirtier water, you're going to want a slower spinner bait. In clearer water, you're going to want a faster spinner bait. That'll dictate the skirt type you use, the blade size and shape that you use, and the bait weight that you use. Normally, I don't use anything under a 3 8 ounce, and I don't use anything over a half ounce. But I am a shallow water spinnerbait fisherman, and typically I'm fishing the spinnerbait slower. Um, but I usually dictate all that by my blades, going from Colorado to make it the slowest, to Indiana, which is somewhere in the middle, to Willa, which lets you fish it real fast. So your spinnerbaits will be based on how clear your water is and how fast you want to fish it. Swim baits and swim jigs, depth and speed. Kind of similar to spinner baits, but a swim jig with the way you retrieve it needs to have a weight and a trailer that allows it to stay in that column of water, whether you're pulling it over trees or grass or just open water. Um, it's going to be dictated based on, like I said, the trailer and the weight of the head. So if you want it to stay deep, you don't want a trailer with a ton of action and a light head. You want a heavier head and maybe a little less action or some combination therein that works for you. Typically, I'm not fishing a swim jig any deeper than 10 feet. Other people might be different, but that's the way I like to fish it. Normally, I'm a power fisherman up shallow with it, and I like to see them come get it off trees So, and docks. They like to eat it off docks, too. But anyway, that's the way I fish them. Um, worms and jigs to probe cover fast. So if you're going to try to fish residential fish in the fall, on a piece of brush, on a tree, on a dock. You want to try to cover it as quickly as you can because these fish are going to be moving all over the place and you want to maximize your efficiency on the water. Um, so I'd use a little bit heavier setup. If you're fishing a shaky head, I'd go from a 1 8 maybe up to a 3 16 so you can keep it on the bottom and fish a little bit faster unless, unless you want to go to the next one, which is a weightless plastic because it's going to vary its fall rate. If those fish are suspended for whatever reason, under docks, around trees, what have you, and you need to change your rate of fall, that is where the weightless plastic can really come in handy. Um, I've seen it where a wacky rig, Senko with no weight, outfishes a shaky head 10 to 1. So interesting to me. 
but I think it's that rate of fall we've talked about before in a previous class. So just try to cover the water column best you can to be as efficient as you can and keep in mind your water clarity, your water depth, and how fast you want to move a bait. Breaking down a lake. I'm going to break down Mountain Island because it's small and it's easy to break down, actually. Um, but you could do this to most any reservoir that has a river, a middle, and a main next to a dam with you know some creeks and coves coming in. If you're going to break down the lower end, typically this is going to be clear, deeper water. So you already know that you're going to have a potential for open water schooling fish in the fall. Bam, right off the front. Off points, off main channel pockets, whatever. There's usually going to be hardly any movement or flow unless they're letting go of the lower dam. If that happens, you may get a little pull, but most of the time down there is going to be your calmest water, which means the fish aren't going to be necessarily dictated to a flow regime. Um, the shad aren't going to be facing straight into a channel. They'll be spread out everywhere, and so will the bass. The points down here are going to extend out a lot further because it's more flat and wide open as versus up in the river where the points will be small and narrow. So if you like to fish points, you like to fish big, wide, flat points that come on out into deeper water, this is the place to be. The fish down here will be more likely to suspend, like we talked about. They're not current driven. They're not going to be pushed into the current or onto the bottom. They can just swim around and hang wherever they want and follow the shad around all day long. They could be over 50 feet of water and feeding in 12. It's it's interesting and it's a fun challenge to, to you know lay up against, but it it's it, you have the opportunity to get right in a hurry down there if you get the right school fired up in the middle of the lake. And also there's usually much less natural cover. Typically that's because that's where most of the homes are in a lake. They're typically down by the dam. If you notice most of your reservoirs, most of the residents, the neighborhoods, the people that like buying land on the lake, they don't want to be up in the river. Chance of flooding, not as pretty, not as near a road, blah, 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 whatever. Most of the residents in a lake are down by the dam and is that the case you know, here on Mountain Island for sure too. So your natural cover is a little less. So we're going to break down the first creek that Mountain Island comes. If you're coming from the dam, heading upstream, the first creek, and there ain't but two on Mountain Island really that, that dictate anything, is Gar Creek. And Gar Creek is bisected. As you can tell, there's a pinch point in the middle. So there's not a ton of flow coming out of Gar. It's got a very small watershed. Uh, if you pull it up on a map, it's not a very big creek. Uh, it just so happens that they dammed up a lake where its watershed is. So they got a little shallow cove in the back and a little bit deeper cove out near the main and turned into a big old bisected cove. So it's pretty nutrient rich in the back especially due to the lack of flow and push through there. But the influx of nutrients from a creek itself, um, that's also what keeps the water stained to green. It can muddy up quick when you get a rain. But most of the time, it's pretty green and algae looking, real, real coppery looking, which is highly productive for bait fish. So if you know anything about Gar Creek, the front and the back in the fall is loaded with shad. Typically, it's also loaded with white perch. But you can get in there and catch you some spotted bass and some residential largemouth during the fall in the early morning and late in the evening on school hard on top water, typically around the pinch point out in open water if they can get Chad ganged up somewhere. But watch the wind here. If the wind is coming out of the northwest, which sometimes it can down the mountain, it'll stack those bait fish in the back of the shallow part of this creek. So keep that in mind. Fortunately in Gar Creek there's a sweet kayak ramp or a kayak access point in Ladder Plantation on the north side of the back part of this creek. Um, excellent place to put in and run around in the back. If you don't like it, you can run around the front and see which one works better. But you can really attack that creek from both sides easily in a kayak or a boat for that matter because you see where the pinch point is and it really changes the dynamic of that creek before it hits the main channel. The other cove, or I'm sorry, the creek is McDowell. McDowell has a much larger watershed. If you follow it up, it goes clear on up to Burkdale, which is uh, Highway 73, just below Lake Norman itself. It gets a lot more inflow, a lot more, you know, 
residential buildings up there, a lot more impervious cover, a lot more creeks feeding it. So there's a lot more junk coming down McDowell. It's kind of bisected as well. It's got a little nick point sticking out about middle of the way there. And that to a degree separates it. That slows down the flow, which is where all the sediment settles out during the flood or what have you. So the back part of McDowell is almost not fishable. Um, it's anywhere from four to one foot loose, loose sediment, full of nutrients. Usually it's green or brown all the time. Um, there's a wastewater treatment plant clean up the the main stem of the creek there about a mile it's it's full of nutrients which is why the shad stay in there but it's difficult to fish back there because it's so shallow so if you go back there you're not going to be fishing no 10 foot crankbaits you're probably going to be fishing wake baits jerk baits and square bills at the most because you just can't get anything else down it's not deep enough so if you go to McDowell be ready for stained water tons of shad though so small spinner baits small shallow running crankbaits swim jigs and stuff like that. But keep in mind, your water's probably going to be murky more times than it ain't if you run back here to find school and fish. There is a ton of shad back there. Check it out. It's worth it. I guarantee you there'll be a boat in there every weekend, every time you go out there. And that's because there's tons of bait fish in there. And the bass will be there. It's just a question of when and what time of the day. Mm. Talking about the river part of a reservoir, which in McDowell is basically anywhere, I mean, I'm sorry, in Mountain Island, it's basically anywhere upstream of McDowell. That is really the last influx of stained water in a major creek um, that Mountain Island gets. So the rest of the water that comes down Mountain Island is out of Lake Norman. Lake Norman is 120 feet deep, so it's always settled out, it's always gin clear, and in that case, you have clear water coming down the main river. So if you want to fish clear water in Mountain Island, you got to go all the way down to the dam or all the way up in the river and you'll find clean water. So the problem with fishing up in the river is we don't have a schedule for the Lake Norman Dam and you can get a big push flow of current up there. If you can get around that, there's some excellent fishing up there because it's cooler water. It's constantly getting a push in there to get oxygen going from the dam release. And there's usually a lot of natural cool, co cool cover up here that pinches the fish down there's not as many places for them to move around up there if you find them in the river odds are they're going to be ganged up so the good thing also if you like fishing trees and natural cover there's not a ton of development in the river especially this one there's hardly any so you got your chance to fish trees and stumps and rocks and anything you want for about four miles without really seeing many homes at all so that's another draw for me up there. I enjoy fishing clear water and I enjoy fishing natural cover. So I love going up there in the fall and even the summer really because that water is a little bit cooler. But in the fall, that place up there is going to turn on quickest if you can get up there safely with all that current coming from Norman. So that's kind of how I would break down a reservoir depending on where you want to fish in the fall, how you want to fish, where you should try to at least get to if you can, kayak or boat. Um, and make the juice worth the squeeze of your trip that day. So in summary, we're, this is where we're going to end the what happens in the fall kind of thing. We're going to shift into baits. So keep a top water ready, whichever one you like, whether it's moving, whether it's a constant retrieve versus a stutter step, whether it's a, you know, just a soft plastic fluke on top, whatever. Keep a top water ready, especially first thing in the morning or when they school. Because the next bullet just says schooling can be all day, especially if you have clouds or wind. They will school wherever they want. They break rules in the fall. They'll come up 10 feet beside your boat where they've never schooled before and be gone in two minutes. So be ready. With the guys that are going to keep fishing the bank like they want to, which is me a lot. I like to go fish the bank and run shallow cover. Um, try to remember to cover as much water as you can while covering the whole column. So top to bottom in various speeds and various shad imitators while you're also bumping the bottom with your favorite you know dock bait or tree bait that you want to pitch and flip just try to keep covering water as much as you can because you'll run into them eventually so <clears throat> the guys that are going to fish the bottom all the time slow bros vary your rate of fall but start faster versus slower so if you're not getting bit on a 3 8 ounce jig or 
an eighth ounce shaky head dropping straight to the bottom and you know there's fish on those docks and you know there's fish in the area and they just won't get bit they've had a bad day a sunny day a negative day if you'll vary your rate of fall it could put a couple more fish in the boat for you and like i said i've seen this happen on a weightless wacky rig cinco for me i'm gonna find natural wood cover with some water on it that's the first thing i'm gonna go do if there's a tree and it's got five to eight at least on it i'm probably gonna fish it and there's probably gonna be fish in it so just keep all these things in mind and if you're out of ideas this is how i would cover the fall transition in five which as a kayak fisherman typically i have to limit myself to five combos if not six but if i was going to do it in five this is what i would do um i'm going to fish two different top waters i'm going to fish a slow top water a fast top water two baits in the middle of the column and one on the bottom so with a top water with a slow moving bait i'm going to use a six foot medium rod with whatever gear ratio you like doesn't matter and that's going to be with, you know, some heavy enough monofilament. If you want braid, that's fine. I'm going to use mono because I get a little bit of stretch with, you know, treble hook baits. But that's going to be with your spooks, your pop bars, your top water um, stutter step walking, popping uh, treble hook baits. Um, I'm going to fish a little differently for my constant retrieve baits with just the reel. But with those, I want a soft rod short rod for accurate casting um and some you know lighter monofilament that gives me a little bit of stretch so i don't pop it out of their mouth when they eat it with a fast moving top water you can go a little heavier and a little longer based on what that top water is there's four different sizes of whopper ploppers now which is the number one you know top water bait going right now so that'll depend based on what size plopper you throw. I'm gonna usually start with 75 or the 90. If you know there's big fish in the area, you can go up to the 110. That's gonna require a little bit beefier rod, so that'll dictate that. Me, I'm gonna stay at the 75 and the 90, so a six foot or six and a half foot, medium to medium heavy is gonna do it. Again, whatever gear ratio reel you want, that makes you comfortable, that you enjoy. Might beef up the raw or the line a little bit um, based on the size of fish that you may catch on the big whopper plopper. Um, just kind of varies to keep that bait on the surface a little bit better. I like a small buzz bait or a ribbit this time of year as well. Cover water, move it through cover, bring them up to the surface, make a reaction strike. And I really do love a wake bait too, shows them something different. A lot of them are going to see whopper ploppers now for the next couple years. So time to start looking outside the box. If you know that they're getting hammered with whopper ploppers, a wake bait's an excellent alternative that not many people fish. Um, I would say <laughs> I know of about four or five people that actually I've seen fish it in the fall uh, as opposed to a ton of people fishing whopper ploppers. So, and that's the reason. The whopper ploppers catches a ton of fish. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes it's nice to have something different as well. So the next reel is really cool. The next combo setup. Um, I'm going to take a lighter spinning setup for my small shad imitation stuff. I'm talking small, like five and a half to six and a half foot, if that, with a light 10 to 20 series reel and some light line, either some light braid or some light mono or fluorocarbon for that matter. And we're going to do some small, fun, clear water stuff. So small flukes, small scrounger heads, small jerk baits and crank baits, and then just a small 16th to 8th ounce jig head that you can put anything on. You can put a fluke on it, you can put a grub on it, a little baby swim bait, whatever. But it's really fun to have that lighter spinning rod to cover a variety of, you know, smaller shad imitations, that'll get you out of a bind when you have a tough day. They'll at least get you a bit, and you never know. It could pull in a big fish for you if they're really keying on small shad. But you gotta have a rod and reel set up so you can throw those small things because your jig rod, if you're throwing a spinning reel, or your fluke rod, if you're throwing a spinning reel that's got 10 or 12 pound mono on it, and it's a 6.6 six medium or even medium heavy, it ain't gonna do it. I promise you that because I've tried. 
So I always set up one lighter spinning rod this time of year to make a small shad imitation where needed. I really enjoy fishing it as well. Light tackle is just a blast, but that's a big one for me right there in the middle. The next one's going to be my 6'6 six, six to 7 foot medium casting rod with whatever slower ratio reel you want. 10 to 12 pound mono or fluorocarbon. This is going to be your middle of the column retrieving rod. It's going to cover your swim jig, your quarter ounce lipless, your Strike King 3XD crankbaits, your bomber crankbaits, your Rapala DT6s and DT10s, and all those different things. Your square bills, of course, all those different things that you want to cover a portion of the column with in a constant retrieve bait. I'm not talking your jerk baits. I'm talking something you're going to wind the whole time to get bit. This is going to be really important if you're trying to cover water fast. Um, like I said, a square bill or a quarter ounce red eye shad, which is a lipless bait from Strike King, are probably two of the easiest baits to cover water with fast because it's a chuck and wind. Um, this will actually let you lay up in the fish, figure out where they're holding, come back with something else, come back with a worm, drop shot, even some top waters to draw them out and kind of pattern some fish a little bit better. But if you want to cover some water and you ain't know what they're doing, you've been to a new lake, whatever, it's real, real easy to pick up a square bill or a quarter ounce red eye and just go down the bank and throw it. You will run into them somewhere. And if you don't, they won't there because they're so opportunistic right now. They're going to eat those shad imitators when it comes by. So that is an important rod and reel for covering water quickly and figuring out what they're doing. The last one for me, other people will have two of these, but I have one. It's for fishing on the bottom. So I'm going to have a spinning reel for this which is a 6'8 to a 7 foot medium light to medium spinning combo. Going to have about a medium sized spinning reel, 20 to 30 series, maybe even a 40. And I will use mono. Typically I don't this time of year. Um, even on any spinning rod, really, I try to stay away from, from mono. Um, I'm going to use you know 10 pound, 8 pound fluorocarbon, stuff like that. Or here recently I've really laid up into braid and I love it. Um, so 15 and 20 pound braid and an 8 pound, 10 pound test liter of fluorocarbon, however long you need it. Um, that's going to be the way I go. And then this is where your shaky head, your Ned rig, your drop shot, your Cinco all come into play. Um, like I said, choose it based on how thick your cover is. Choose it based on are the fish suspended. Choose it based on whether or not you need a slower rate of fall. But your spinning rod is going to be able to tote your worm for the day that's going to be on the bottom when all these other things aren't working. Or when you get to a dock, you really want to skip under to see if there's a fish under there. Grab this rod, grab your you know Senko or your shaky head or Ned rig and skip it under there. See if there's a fish hiding under there. That'll tell you whether or not you're doing the right thing. But if I had to do it in five, and I took a lot of time fooling with this, I think this is the best way I could set it up. And... This is exactly how I set up for my most recent tournament um, when we went out. So this helps me cover the column. This helps me figure out all my options and outliers. And eventually, with this setup in the fall, you will run into what they're doing or what they're not doing. So going through each one of these, my top slow which is, you know, you have to work the bait with your rod tip and sporadic action. These are going to be the top key ones. So the Pop R is classic. It's been around for years and years and years. It's still an excellent bait. You can upsize it to the Magnum up there, that P65 in the top left. If you want to show them something a little bit bigger, a little bit different. Um, but to get bit, that regular P60, P61 size is going to be number one. And you can throw it on a bait caster or spinning rod. Um, that little fellow, the P50 there is a tiny pop R. It's excellent for school and fish, but you've got to throw it on a spinning rod. I recommend nothing heavier than 10 pound braid or eight pound mono to get some distance in case, you know, you need to reach some school and fish. And the bait to the right, everybody should know it. That's the Spook, Super Spook, the Magnum Spook, and Super Spook Junior. And then the, um, oh my gosh, Zara Puppy is what's at the bottom. I forgot the name of it for a second. Um, 
walking baits versus popping baits. One can work better than the other one. One's noisier than the other one. One's quieter than the other one, but shows a zigzag escape mood. And in the middle, you have the two at the bottom. You have the Lucky Craft Gunfish in three different sizes, which is going to walk and chug a little bit. And then the other fella on the right is the chug bug uh, by Storm. So, again, a little bit of pop, a little bit of walk. So, those are kind of in between the pop R and the spook, but they'll give you the best of both worlds to a degree. If I had to have one top water to do everything, I'd probably have to say it'd be the Lucky Craft Gunfish, which is the bottom left picture. In the about three and a half, four inch size, it's just a, a great bait. Um, it does everything you want it to do and some, and it'll do enough of the walking that it'll act like the spook, but it also has a little bit of the chugging from the pop R. It's not going to be as loud as a pop R. It's not going to walk as clean as a spook, but it's a good middle of the road. A little expensive though. They're about 15, 16 bucks, but excellent topwater bait. So for topwater fast, you're going to look at the whopper plopper, of course, the buzz baits, the buzz and frogs, and also stuff like wake baits down at the bottom. The bottom left is an H2O Express wake bait from Academy. It is absolutely my number one favorite wake bait. I think I have four of them in my box right now. They're about four or five bucks and they fish phenomenally. They've designed the bait well. It's heavy. I think it's a three eighths ounce bait. Um, stays right on the surface, has a little knocker in it. Excellent way to show them something different early in the morning or in a cloudy day when they're used to seeing other normal top waters that other guys fish. The bait to its right is a Jackal Mikey Jr. Harder to find now, they're from Japan and having a hard time to find them. I started fishing that bait about, oh gosh, I don't even know, six, seven years ago. Um, has a different look as a wake bait. It's almost like a swim bait wake bait because of its double joints and has a little clacking sound to it. If you can find it and you wanna spend a little bit of money on wake baits, it's an excellent choice. I uh, caught a ton of fish on it. I just hadn't bought a new one in a long time because I can't find them very good anymore, but they're also expensive. They're about 17 bucks. Top left, everybody knows about that. That's your Whopper Plopper. The one at the bottom in that picture is the new 75. It's a little shorter, but way fatter than the 90, which is above it. The good thing about the 75 is they put the cup tail from the 110 on the 75. And you can kind of tell that in the picture um, but the 110, which is the third one down, has the quietest tail gurgle, I suppose. And it's, you know, a good small size. When they made the 75, which is the one on the bottom, which is the fat bellied one, they stuck a big old tail on it. So it's got a loud tail and a fat belly, different profile altogether. And I've already caught a few fish on it. It's a little different. It's worth fishing. If you like ploppers, go ahead and get you a 75. But, you know, the 110 um, and the 90 are always going to be, you know, the ones everybody talks about over and over. So, yeah, ploppers work. If you throw them in a wind, you'll get bit. It's, the problem is I think we're going to hit a period where they stop getting bit as good, maybe, um, just because they've seen them so much. The guy in the middle there is your Stanley Rivet. Easy bait to fish. Put it on a weighted hook or a big keel thick hook with a nose ring in it, something to screw into his nose, to keep him straight, and fish it like a buzz bait. The feet are going to gurgle, make a sweet little noise. There's nothing like the sound of a rivet in the morning. Um, hookup ratio is not going to be quite as good, but she's weedless, so you can run her through grass and lily pads and things like that. And uh, you can have some really good days on a rivet, and you can have some really frustrating days on a rivet, which is where your buzz bait comes in. A lot of different buzz baits right now. The cool thing going is putting a horny toad on your buzz bait don't know what it does but the fish like it the pros are doing it some local sticks are using it um, the buzz bait that's on the rock there in the small picture with the little two flat blades that's my baby that's my favorite buzz bait it's from a company called confidence baits and those are counter rotating flat blades with a quarter ounce buzz bait that thing will crawl slow has a small profile and i'm going to go over it a little bit more later on uh, but that's my baby. Of course, you can use the old twin barrel blades that hold the bait real flat and create a bunch of commotion or put a buzz bait on with a clacker 
that's going to draw a lot of sound and you know typically that will be a turn on or a turn off based on how the fish are behaving most of the time i don't think they care about the blade um i think it's the movement and the noise you know i don't i don't think that the clacker being there is going to turn them off i think it'll be you know just kind of to deter fishermen more than fish i think the clacker is a good thing in my opinion so middle of the column spinning which was that little rod i told you about this is where i have my little fun baits with me so zoom tiny flukes power bait drop shot minnows and a three inch size and then those little 16th and 8th ounce scrounger heads in the middle that you can put anything on those are a blast to fish uh, they don't take much action they're open hooks so you can really pull them in to the fish with lighter line and lighter tackle and then you go to your small hard baits on the right there that's a i think that's a rapala floating original fj5 and um, then the one on the bottom is a rapala ultralight minnow or ultralight shad i think crankbait little baits everything eats them the bluegill worry to death to the water cool you know cools way off but you'll be able to put pretty much every spotted bass that's out school and in the boat with these if you get it near them and then in the middle just to show you i mean a, a little naked jig head <coughs> excuse me is extremely versatile um you can put a worm on there you can put a fluke on there a grub anything you want a little swim bait and just fish through the column at whatever depth you want based on the weight of the jig and keep it there you know hold your rod tip down and wind slow and you'll have a kind of a column search bait with a, a small finesse approach so it's worth thinking about having a few sets of jig heads in your box as well but this is probably my most fun rod and reel while i'm out there when i want to just have a blast i put something small on my spinning rod and go have fun so when you pick up your 6.6 medium or medium heavy or 7 foot medium crankbait rod um, for generic crankbait use or generic spinnerbait use, this is the meat and potatoes that you're going to be looking to throw. Your lipless crankbaits like the red-eye shad down at the rod up the bottom right, your series 3XDs which is on the middle on the right, and then your KVD 1.5s on the top right which is probably the absolute best search bait I've ever used. Um, they're going to cover water. They're going to get bit pretty much 10, 11 months out of the year. Um, it's a good way of searching. If you don't know where you want to set up shop, it will let you know where they are and where they ain't quick. If you keep it in the water. Um, another one of my favorites down there in the bottom is a little John MD crankbait in that, uh, shad color he's got right there in the picture. Um, flat sided bait. When the water starts getting more cool, typically outperforms a round bait. Don't know why, it just happens. Something with the vibration, they just like a flat bait. Swim jig, which I've been playing with a lot more. That one in the middle at the top is a Strike King quarter ounce bleeding bitsy bug. They're hard to find. If you can find them, go ahead and get you a couple. They're pretty cheap. And uh, I'll teach you how I rig it up here in a little bit. But that little dude easy to cast just swim it back in with a good little trailer on the back you'd be surprised what it'll produce the weed guards made out of monofilament it's not very stiff fibers like on a flipping jig and um, it'll compress pretty easily when a fish takes it so i like that little swim jig i don't fish huge swim jigs because i don't feel like i get bit as much and the shad right now are pretty small so i like that little guy he's kind of one of my favorites um spinner baits of course and chatter baits depending on what you're most confident in um, throw them on a rod you're comfortable with, medium, medium, heavy, depending on their weight. Um, and then, like I said, skirts, blades, all that's dependent on water clarity. But this is a family of style of baits that I would have a rod for um, when going out. And then on the bottom, you know, you got your drop shot ready to go for suspended fish or to show them something different uh, around docks. Or if they're schooling and you can hang it right in front of their face, drop shot's pretty versatile. Um, kind of a misunderstood rig. A lot of people kind of shy away from it. They quote unquote don't know how to fish it. Uh, it's pretty simple to learn once you uh, throw all that mess out of your head and start throwing it. It's hanging a finesse worm in front of their face or right off the bottom. I mean, you can learn how to fish it pretty fast when they're biting. Below that, a Senko, hugely versatile bait. Right now, most people are going to be wacky rigging it because it is going to fall in a more tantalizing manner. 
Um, you can skip it a lot easier, and it's not going to foul up on the hook as easy as if you Texas rig it and you start skipping it, which is the picture, the image below that one. If you weightless Texas rig it, um, it has more of a chance to not fall quite as natural because you've taken some of the backbone or you've added some backbone to the bait, and it's not going to fall quite as clean as it would have if it was wacky rigged. But yes, you will miss fish with a wacky rig because that hook's in the middle, and a lot of times the fish will tail bite it. So, wacky rig Cinco. Excellent producer. Texas Rig Cinco works as well. It's just you're not going to get quite as much action, but it'll be weedless and you won't miss as many fish. Top right, Ned Rig has taken off the past three years. Um, I fished it a lot, caught a ton of fish on it. Um, my choice would be the one in the middle, which is the big TRD. And I fish mine on about a tenth ounce to a sixth ounce uh, Ned Head by Z Man. Um, the picture on the bottom there, the punch crawls, is a bait they've had. They've got a new TRD crawl out now, which I didn't get a picture of, unfortunately. It is amazing. It's very small, very compact crawl bait. Stands straight up and down. Excellent bait. It's going to be a killer sight fishing bait come this next spring. Um, if you haven't fished an Ed rig yet, for some odd reason, they love to eat that little straight tail worm on a jig head. I don't know why. Nobody does, but they love to eat it. So if you got open water... Because the weed guards on these things, if you even get one with a weed guard, is pretty flimsy. Um, just go ahead and, and try to fish in a little bit more open water if you can. Points, under docks, stuff like that, but not in thick brush. You will lose them a lot. Because typically you're throwing these on light line. You're not sitting there with a 17-pound line on this thing. It's usually 8 or lighter. So you will lose a lot of them. And then the bottom right, old classic shaky head. Pick whatever head and weight you like, whatever worm you know length color whatever you like um you know this can also be an option for that spinning rod that i had at the end there for covering the bottom okay let's take a sip of drink and i'm gonna go over shad imitators soft plastic shad imitators so these are the three bait fish in north and south carolina that we're gonna say are bait uh, when we use that word, um, most of them are thread fins. And then when you get down into South Carolina, fishing lakes like Murray and Hartwell and and uh, Clark's Hill, they have a lot of blueback herring. Um, and then all our lakes have gizzard shad. They get huge. You'll see them, you know, at dams with guys netting these giant shad, or you'll see them cruising through grass mats. Right now on Mountain Island, they're actually swimming through grass mats. They're like 12 and 14 inches long. They're massive. But anyway, that's how you tell them apart based on their lips and their eyes um, and how their mouth's behaving. So if you want to know about thread fin versus alewife blueback versus gizzard, there you go. We're going to dive into their baits. <clears throat> so curly tail grubs. Mm. A classic that's quickly forgotten and has its place. So Fat Albert by Zoom is probably one of the best. Um, company named Kalins makes another good um, curly tail grub, really high quality bait. But you can use these in a plethora of ways. And I got them pulled up here. Um, most of them are going to be used on a retrieved bait. Very few of them will be used on a bait where... You're just hopping it on the bottom and moving it in slower movements. Um, you know, stutter step, not a continuous move. Um, the most classic up there, the top left, is on an eighth to quarter ounce jig head. It just swam slowly on a spinning rod. A lot of guys are putting them on Alabama rigs because they do not take as much pull or as much movement to have action. That tail is really thin and narrow and it catches water no matter what direction it goes. So it doesn't take as much movement or pull for a curly tail grub to have its action as it will some other baits we'll talk about in a minute. You can bulk up a spinner bait with them. You can bulk up a swim jig with them. You know, whatever you want to do to add a little bit more body but not as hard of an action to the tail is where a grub comes in. I use them on... Um, the jig head like that at the top when things get really tough caught a lot of fish doing that my favorite color for that is salt and pepper or watermelon seed i have used them on a swim jig like in the left middle and the bottom left and 
that's if I want to fish it a lot slower with less action. One key thing though I'll tell you, and it's underlined there in the text, is if you want to try something new, go get you a twin tail fat Albert, which is the picture there, and get you a color you like, and just fish it with like a three or four aught EWG hook with no weight on the top. And it's a cheap, efficient, small topwater frog bait. A lot of people have never done that before. I used to do it a ton when I was a kid because I couldn't go get ribbits at Bass Pro Shops living in Southern Virginia. So fortunately, my Walmart and my tackle shops had twin tail fat Alberts. If you get twin tail fat Alberts and you put a hook in them and you hold that rod tip up and wind, it turns into a small frog. So just keep that in mind. If you got twin tail fat Alberts at the house, trust me, put a hook in them, take them out, hold your rod tip up and wind, you'll see a small frog come to life on top. So just a little tip. Swim baits. This is an exploding arena. California started it, moving all over the country. Now everybody fishes swim baits of some size, shape, or orientation. Up in the top left in that picture, you've got your hollow bellied swim baits. Those are the two most often used weighting mechanisms, hooking mechanisms. A lot of guys use a big old jig head now to fish offshore. I would not use that up next to the bank. You are going to get hung up. Uh, fishing points, fishing open bridge pilings, whatever, that's fine. You're going to throw the thing around docks and trees, you need to use that weighted Texas rig hook like in the bottom of that picture. A lot of action, a lot of weight, a lot of length, um, a lot of aggressive bulk to this. You know, the rigging's big, the bait's tail is big. It's just a louder presentation for me than some other swim baits. But they work great. They usually draw out bigger fish. They tear up easy, though. You have to keep that in mind because it's hollow. So keep that in mind. And they're kind of expensive, too. Usually about 8 to 9 to $10 a pack. The one to the right of it helped me learn how to swim jig fish on Lake Baden in the grass down there around the Alcoa area. That's a Lake Fork Live Magic Shad in the middle there on the top. It's got serrated um, body parts down the side. And because of that, the tail swims really well with just a pull through the water. Problem is, those ribs in between those thick chunks of plastic are extremely thin to the point to where a three pounder can jump and shake his head while you're in the middle of a fight and sling those tail segments off. So not very durable, excellent tail action, and a different look swim bait that a lot of people aren't throwing. Try it on a weighted hook. A jig head is fine. I like it on a swim jig. It really bulks up about a 3 8 ounce swim jig really well. And though its brother to the right there is the boot tail style of the Light Magic Shad, which adds a little bit more thump. So a little more natural in the middle with the fork tail, a little more thump on the right with the boot tail. The swim Cinco on the bottom left, they basically stuck a boot tail and put it on a Cinco worm. Uh, real narrow, real subtle, good on a swim jig, good on a Carolina rig as well. Um, a lot of people don't think about that, but that thing's going to fall down on a Carolina rig. And when you go to pull it again, that little dude's going to swim up off the bottom real slow because that boot tail makes it rise. So don't neglect the swimming Cinco for a bunch of different riggings. I enjoy them. They're just so expensive. You have to know what you're getting into. Eight, nine dollars a pack for like, you know, six or seven of them. So. They have their place, a little expensive, but a cool little bait that a lot of people don't throw. The one in the bottom middle, everybody is throwing. That's a Key Tech Swing Impact or Swing Impact Fat, depending on which one you get. It's the ringed swim bait that came out in the past couple years with the really thin flat tail in the back. Because that tail is flat, very thin plastic, it does not take much action to move it. Body is short. A lot of action on a slow retrieve. Works great in the fall and in the winter. Fishing it really slow. Really compact little bait. I like it on a jig head just the way it's laid out there. Guys have been fit, fishing it on their Alabama rigs. Um, you can fish it on a weighted hook if you want. To fish it through cover. I love it on a jig head though. That's my favorite way of fishing it. Extremely copied bait now. A lot of companies are coming out with their own little ringed paddle tail swim bait. So you can find some near you in the color you want, however you want. Bass Pros is actually not that bad. It's actually a pretty good bait. And the one on the bottom right is a skinny dipper. 
that um, Reaction Innovations come out with. Kind of the same kind of style with the boot tail and everything as a swim fluke, a swimming fluke, which came out later. But they have a little bit different head shape and a little bit different body shape. They were the first people to come out with the all solid boot tail, clean looking swim bait like that after the paddle tail craze came out with the hollow bellies. So um, a lot of guys still fishing the skinny dipper by Reaction Innovations, but there's so many different swim baits now. You can go take your pick on what you want to accomplish. The main thing is figure out the rigging you need, the weight you want, the color you like, the action you need, and you'll find a swim bait that'll do it for you. There's tons of them now. So have fun with this, but this is a stop and go bait that's not going to do anything on the, the fall unless you have enough weight on it. If you have it weighted horizontally, it's not going to do anything like a belly weighted hook. If you have it jig headed, He's going to spiral and swim down all the way to the bottom. All you really want to do with these guys is wind either slow, moderate, or fast, and they're going to do the job for you. <clears throat> and then straight shad style, shad style worms. You know, a white trick worm is, is one of the old classics. I got a buddy that fishes it all the time. Um, good for covering the water, good for showing them something different than a fluke. Um, it's I don't know why they eat a white worm, but they love it. Um, it's a cool thing to try around people that are fishing flukes and other top waters. Just show them something a little different. The same thing with the worm to the right there on the top. That's a wave worms tiki stick that I can't hardly find anymore in that black shad color. I used to wacky rig that thing right in the middle and pull it up near a dock or pull it up near a tree and have it just wiggle right on the surface water, right at the surface creating little ripples looking like a dying shed and they would come up and destroy it so that was a fun way to fish that bait you can also fish it wacky rig letting it fall or texas rig letting it fall but i found a new way of fishing that thing because it was heavy enough to lay up in that surface water and make those wiggles and look alive so that was actually a cool way of fishing it but that's another way you can mimic shad this time of year with soft plastic the bottom left is a Yamamoto shad shaped worm. It is probably one of the absolute best drop shot baits on the market. That tiny little tail down there in the back end doesn't take hardly any movement to let that thing wiggle. Um, small compact little bait fish, tons of different colors, nose hook that thing on a drop shot and pitch it out around fish and it will get bit. Um, again, a little more expensive. It's a Yamamoto bait. I think you're gonna pay eight, nine dollars a pack for them. Um, they're a little more durable than the Senko because of their shape and their, their build, their pore. Um, and they are probably only fished on a drop shot. I've never fished one a different way. I'm sure you could, but that's the way I fish them. And in the bottom right, a good classic Lunker City Sluggo. It was the fluke before the fluke and the Senko before the Senko. It does have a little bit of serration in it about midway of the belly that shows a little action to the tail but they're kind of stiff they don't hold a hook point extremely well um, a little plasticky for me now after we fished Senkos and flukes for so many years but they kind of started it all with the um, dead fall shad imitator soft plastic and now we're going to get to everybody's favorite and mine, the flukes. So Zoom kind of dominates the fluke market now. And flukes, I'm talking about a weightless shad type fork tail bait for all intents and purposes. So they have five models. This is not counting the swimming fluke um, or the fluke stick, which is the new one that they took a Senko and stuck it. Well, actually took an ultra vibe speed worm and cut the tail off and stuck a fluke tail on it. But this is the fluke section. So the tiny fluke's three inches. It does not have a belly slit. It does not have the flaps and its tail is, um, I think it's tail is still, yeah, it's still flat. I don't think it's vertical. Um, I think that's right. I'm thinking about it out loud now. Yes, I think it's flat. <coughs> Pretty stiff plastic, not much salt in it. Uh, I like to fish them nose hooked weightless. I like to fish them on a scrounger. I like to fish them on a jig head. Um, excellent for getting bit when you need to. Real small, real subtle, great clear water bait. Tons of fish caught on it. 
The four inch fluke, a little bit bigger. Again, no belly slip. Um, same kind of tail, a little bit bigger. Tougher to rig up, weedless Texas style. It's hard to hit that keel of that belly. The belly on the fluke and the tiny fluke have a boat style V hull keel, keel underneath them. Really hard to line it up straight to rig it up perfectly through the middle of the bottom to the middle of the top, which is where your Super Fluke Junior and Fluke come into play. When they built those baits, and the Magnum Fluke for that matter, the top right, they added those belly slits so that that hook point can go straight up in the center and come and lay up on the top of the back while hiding as much of that hook gap as they could. Excellent bait. Everybody has thrown a Fluke, if not a Fluke Junior. Um, weightless. Uh, I've Carolina rigged them. I put them on a scrounger head. I put them on a chatter bait, spinner bait, everything. Probably one of the most absolute versatile, you know, baits on the market. And everybody has had a pack of flukes. And that's the reason why. It's because you fish them weightless. It's very visual. The fish like it. Easy to catch fish in the spring and fall on it. So um, if you don't fish a fluke, and you have clear water around you, go ahead and get you some and learn how to fish them because it can be some of the best fishing you'll get all year. And then other flukes, like we talked about, the Strike King Caffeine Shad came out about four or five years ago. Basically, they took a fluke and added a trick worm style tail to it and pumped it pump full of salt. Um, that has a little bit different fall to it because of the tail style and the weight of it. The D Shad at the bottom there by Yamamoto is the same kind of way. Um, just a different brand. The three inch bass assassin, shad assassin in the top right there is my dad's favorite fluke. It's really small. It's got a tiny little belly slit to it. Real small, subtle tail. It's just little and darts around a lot and fish just seem to crush it. But uh, real small, real subtle. Hard to find though. If you can find them, good for you. They're hard to find. You can find zooms everywhere. Uh, and the Lunker City Finesse Shad, again, um, you know, they have the Sluggo, and there's the Finesse Shad. They have another one called the Finesse Fish. It's a little bit longer. Um, again, hard to find. A little bulky. If I was going to fish these, I would probably just stick with a jig head. Really hard to rig Texas style. Maybe nose hook, but mostly I'd put a jig head in them if I was going to fish that. <coughs> these are the different rigs that you're going to be able to do with all your flukes. Like I said, top right, put a jig head in them. You'd be surprised how simple that rig is that it catches tons of fish. Um, it lets you fish a fluke deep and fast with an open hook. School and fish, it's excellent. Um, another way is is putting a um, chin spinner head or road runner head, whatever you call it, with a blade on it. A lot of guys are doing this in the winter to slow it way down and fish it deep um, for bigger fish suspended down you know, way deep in the winter. The one below that is your scrounger head, puts a lot more action into the bait, holds the bait a little higher in the column, but almost acts like a crankbait for a fluke, shakes it back and forth, open hook, good for covering water. The top right is the way everybody has fished a fluke, which is weightless and Texas rigged um, for fishing it high in the column around cover. I do a lot of nose hooking, which is the next picture down with that white and chartreuse one. I think it makes the bait fall faster because it's pulling it down by the nose instead of letting the bait fall horizontally like it would in the top picture on the right there. It gets that bait falling down faster. So if you're going to be fishing down with a weightless fluke slow, um, the nose hooking helps that. You will miss fish that tail bite or back bite that bait. Most of the time, those nicer ones take it from the head and you have that open hook there. It's easy to land the fish, but you will get tail bit. Excuse me. The the rig in the middle there is the pop rivet rig where you stick a rivet through the fluke and let your line go through it and you tie a treble hook and cinch it back up into the bait. This is kind of help prevent missing fish, but this ain't gonna work fished around docks or trees or grass or anything like that. In my opinion, this would only be used for schooling fish, in my opinion. Um, and if you're missing that many on a fluke and school and fish, then yeah, you may need to do something else. But uh, I would never use that bait just around, you know, the bank, beating the bank around cover at all. You're going to get hung up all the time. <coughs> the bottom right, belly weighted hook, lets you fish the bait a little bit deeper, has a little bit more wobble to it because you're pulling down faster. Um, it can overpower the bait a little bit, so be careful with that. Most people don't fish that unless you're fishing some type of current or some salt water with some tide stuff. So.
Um, most of the time, you're going to be fishing these guys. A wait list running jig head. <coughs> okay. I'm going to throw out some of my secret weapons here. And then we'll finish it up. This little guy is the slider three inch bass grub. Uh, I found this thing a few years back. I started putting it on a little jig head, trying to make a micro swim bait out of it. And I went back in a creek and I was fishing and I wasn't getting bit like I wanted. It was going too fast. It was going to the bottom too fast. It was getting hung up a little bit. And I decided to try to fish it weightless. And I pulled out a two alt hook just to see if it would, you know, barrel roll or whatever. And if you weight this with a two alt hook, no weight, just a good thick gauge two alt EWG hook, he will swim right on the surface and be a, the absolute most subtle little vertical, little swim bait coming through the top of the column that I've ever seen. Um, once I did that, I caught fish the rest of the day on it. I couldn't believe it, flabbergasted. Um, it's a bait that not many people go after. It's small. <coughs> you will need to throw it on a spinning rod. Nothing bigger than 10 pound braid, nothing bigger than 8 pound mono. But it also works really well on a buzz bait and a swim jig for real, real subtle trailer options. Um, like I said, I have rigged it on a small jig head, and in the wintertime that worked, but in the springtime, summertime, it's better to fish it on top. Go think about it. If you have any questions, holler at me. This is a little bait that I've been fishing the last three to five years, eh, probably three years, that has caught me a lot of fish when nothing else would. The white one is key. I really like the white. This is a setup that's always rigged up on my rod, except for in big, big fishing situations where I'm catching huge fish. This is my tiny fluke setup. So it's built just like you see it there and I've broken down each part of it. If you use this, you need a light rod, light to ultra light, but you can get by with a light if you add that nail weight in there and some light setup stuff. Eight pound mono, 10 pound braid with a mono leader, fluoro leader, an ultra light to a light combo. I have found that half a nail stuffed down into that power bait three inch minnow works perfect. And when you do this and you cut that nail in half, you need to push that nail down in there as straight as you can down the bait, as even as you can, far enough to where that nose hook, that little number two, number one octopus hook, doesn't hit it because it'll make it kick off to one side or the other while you're trying to rig it. If you rig it up just like I have it right there and fish it on light tackle and twitch it on the surface and then let it fall, you will catch so many smaller spotted bass that it is a blast. And I have caught big fish on it too, four, five, and six pound fish on it. So if you want to have fun, if you want to you know, see a very visual bite where you know you're going to get bit, the sunfish will not leave you alone with it if they're at all active. That's one warning I'm going to give you with it. But it is a blast of fish. It's very visual. Everything in the lake will eat it. And it's gotten me out of many a pickle. And that's my tiny fluke setup. And I hope it helps you because it has saved my life in a bunch of different fishing trips. So um, you need a small setup for it. Again, if you have questions about the setup, hit me up here. I'll try to walk you through it. I've kind of perfected it over the last three to four years. And I'm really, really pleased with it. It's always rigged up for me. And then this is not necessarily a rigging as much as it is a bait. This is a fluke style bait that's made by a company that you can't get in a store anywhere around here. It's made by Case Plastics. And I found them when I was fishing at Virginia Tech going to college. They made... A fluke. This is a fluke. It's about four inches long. This is the salty sinking minnow. They also have one called a salty sinking shad, which is bigger, but I'm going to talk about the minnow. It's about the size of a Zoom Super Fluke Junior with like twice the weight. It's so packed full of salt, it falls way faster. Now, because of that, 
It is really, really good in clear water situations in the fall and winter. It sucks for a topwater. Not a good topwater bait at all. It will not stay up there. It's going to fall. So if you need to visually watch the fall or you need a fluke that will fall really well, if you want a bigger one than this, look at the Salty Sinking Shad by Case Plastics. But for this size, a small four inch size, it's phenomenal for drop fishing. I fish it both of those ways you see on the picture there. I fish it with a one or a one on octopus nose hooked if I want it to go down even faster because that's going to pull the nose down and make it fall even quicker. Or I fish it on a 2 or 3 aught EWG worm hook. If you fish a 3 aught on this bait, it is going to completely fill it up all the way. A 2 aught would be better if you are worried about taking over too much of the action of the bait. But I'm dropping the bait, guys. I'm letting it just fall most of the time and twitching it a little bit. So most of the time, I fill it up with a 3 aught. Just whatever hook you're comfortable with. I wouldn't go to a 1 aught or a 4 aught. I'd stay in that 2 or 3 aught range. You have to order them online. Go to caseplastics.com and look up the minnow. You can also look up the shad. It's bigger. It's super heavy. But this dude right here, and that's a phenomenal color. That's that crystal blue flash. Works really, really well in clear water as a drop fluke. Sucks for top water. Great for a falling bait. And then this is my baby. This is my Confidence Baits Finesse Buzz Bait. Uh, it's a company that I found, um, did a lot of smallmouth river custom baits, and I wanted something new to try for the new river fishing up in the mountains of North Carolina, and I picked up this buzz bait. And as it comes out of the package, it has a hand-tied skirt to it. Well, I fished it like that and caught a ton of fish like that until the skirt got beat all to pieces. And I was upset one day when the skirt just finally cut up, you know, it finally got beat up. So I decided to throw this little three inch slider bass grub on there instead with no skirt and it worked even better. So if you want to show them a different style of buzz bait, this is a small quarter ounce buzz bait, counter rotating flat blades, take the skirt off of it. You can fish it with the skirt on if you want, but I take the skirt off and I thread that slider three inch bass grub on there in white. You can put whatever color you want. But that little setup right there has caught me a ton of fish on top water when no other top water was working. It's very subtle. It's slow. It's got a quiet little gurgle to it. Catches a lot of fish in the morning and, you know, all day if they're hitting top water that may or may not strike a bigger buzz bait or a bigger top water. So if you want a subtle buzz bait for covering the surface and showing something different, this little guy is the trick to use. So. There's another one of my secret weapons. With that, I'm going to turn it off. I appreciate y'all watching the video. Again, if you have questions, please feel free to shoot me a message, uh, comment on the video, whatever. I'll give you everything I have that I know about soft plastic shad imitators. Um, there's not a ton of them, but there's a bunch of them in each section. So it's not too awful complicated. You can't ever hardly go wrong if you just choose white. You can't ever go wrong if you go smaller. So keep that in mind. But I'm going to close the class off right now. And I appreciate all y'all watching all this. I hope some of my little secret weapons here have done you some good. And maybe it'll be a new fun way for you to go out and catch some fish. The Bass Grub by Slider is phenomenal. It's very versatile. It's a smaller bait. That little tiny fluke right there is a blast of fish, guys. If you like fishing ultralight tackle or a light tackle, please give it a shot. It is a hoot in clear water. And the salty sinking mena. I'll be fishing this bait right here from November all the way through January, um, wherever I need to drop a fluke in some cooler water and draw some clear water bass out from a dock or a tree or whatever. So... Again, I hope I've helped you guys with some fall fishing. I hope I'll give you some ideas of some new stuff to try as these bait fish get more and more congregated for us and the bass start eating them. Anything you need, please give me a holler. I really appreciate it. All the support for the class, and I hope to see you on the water.